Perfect. Yeah. Page. Just, 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 you want me to page you right now? Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to sign the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the program evaluation and uh, please give the CME committee any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today uh, we have uh, three and possibly four presenters. Uh, Jamie Warg uh, is a wound ostomy and continence nurse. Dr. Mark Vandenberg is a, a general surgeon, a uh, member of the surgery staff here at uh, Mary Greeley and uh, McFarland. Dr. Greg Sachs is also a surgeon, also on the staff here. And finally, Dan Christopher, who has extensive uh, experience in the implementation of hyperbaric oxygen therapy services. And uh, they're here uh, today to give us an update on wound care and uh, hyperbaric oxygen. And uh, please join me in welcoming our presenters. <laughs> There. Luckily for you, the only thing I'm going to say is that I'm between cases and I need to go back. So those of you that have heard me speak before should clap again. <laughs> Shut that one off or take it upstairs. Am I on? Can you hear me? Testing. I'm, I'm Greg Sachs. I'm one of the surgeons. I've, uh, I've been here for about four years and I'm happy to be here. I didn't really even get a chance to look at many of these slides, so if I start rambling, that's why. Um, so I, I've, I've been involved in the wound care um, aspect of things since shortly after I came here. Um, and I think we have a very excellent wound care team, and they do the lion's share of the work um, in establishing those good outcomes and good patient care. So we're going to talk about the team. Most of this talk is about pressure ulcers, and then, and then the end of it's gonna be about hyperbarics, which is something that we have here that we haven't had before. I'm not sure of the timeline of that, sometime in the next calendar year, I believe. Um, so, I also have no financial disclosures. And our objectives, again, mostly we're gonna be talking about pressure ulcers and, and that aspect of wound care. Uh, recognizing preventative strategies because a lot, a lot of, of uh, sorry if I'm, what am I doing there? Um, a lot of where we can make the biggest impact in my, in, in my opinion is preventing the pressure ulcer to begin with. And once, once we establish a pressure ulcer, yeah, we do a good job of taking care of it and getting to the heel. But where we can, where we can make our biggest impact is, is identifying risk factors and prevention for patients at risk and being diligent about skin care and skin hygiene and, and preventing the ulcer from developing to begin with. Um, and then we'll talk about some treatments, um, but, but most of it's gonna be identification and, and prevention. Um, so our core wound care team, it's, it's uh, uh, multi-specialties. Um, we uh, have podiatry on board, we have general surgeons on board. We also, not on this list, we have our infectious disease, uh, Dr. Fulton often helps and collaborates with wound care, and, uh, and uh, sometimes even orthopedic surgeons are involved in wound care. So that, the, the five guys there are, are, the, are the most prominent in wound care, but there are other collaborators as well. So uh, a little bit about the, the disease process. So pressure injuries are very common, um, affects millions of Americans. And even can ultimately contribute to death. Um, you, get, you get bad uh, stage four pressure ulcers, leads to osteomyelitis, chronic wounds, chronic infection, and it's not a, quick, it's not generally a quick death, but it definitely uh, contributes to a slow decline in their overall state of health, and ultimately contributes to their death. Um, cost of pressure injuries is huge, um, and. Um, because if they get a, uh, a large, deep pressure ulcer, stage three, stage four, that is weeks, if not months, of wound care, um, hospitalizations, and, and sometimes surgical debridements and grafts and flaps. And so it is, it is a huge cost burden on our overall medical community. And, and is, it, is it, what am I doing to make it do that? Is that... Am I dancing too much? I was trying to. I was trying to limit my Britney Spears moves, but I'm better with umbop. And then, fairly recently, it's pressure injuries are. I believe, what 
in the category of never events, and, and, and so if somebody develops a pressure sore in the hospital um, that is not documented upon um, admission, then Medicare will not reimburse uh, for any care related to that pressure ulcer. Fun facts, I didn't know we had fun facts. <laughs> um, um, so uh, my fun fact that I was actually, I forgot to say at the beginning, one, the thing I want you guys to pay attention to while you're sitting here listening is I want you to pay attention to how, how much you shift in your chair um, and how much you shift your own weight subconsciously because when we have our, all of our faculties and, and sensations and whatnot, you will notice that just sitting here listening, you will, you will probably shift your weight every, every two to three minutes. And that's, that's even it happens as we sleep. So we are wired to prevent pressure injury by subconsciously shifting our weight. And as we get forward in the talk, we'll talk about how that contributes to two pressure injuries in people that have, have decreased sensation, lack of mobility, and other risk factors that, that they can't do that. So very little pressure causes occlusion of blood vessels. Uh, so 33 millimeters mercury pressure um, causes tissue ischemia, um, and that then leads to pressure injury. And this also, and it's not listed on this, this slide here, but this happens fairly quickly. You can, get, you can start to get significant pressure damage within minutes in really the, the whole two hour recommendation for rotating or shifting patients and, and repositioning them is, is it within two hours or, or after two hours, if you, don't, if you don't reposition a patient that can't reposition themselves or aren't on a, um, mattress to distribute weight and pressure more evenly, <clears throat> they will start to get um, irreversible skin damage and then skin breakdown. So the pathophysiology, um, well, again, comes down to pressure. But so when the pressure exceeds the capillary pressure, so the, 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 the blood perfusion to the skin and subcutaneous tissue, that is, that is, that is that's, it's all about ischemia. It's all about lack of blood flow. So pressure is higher than the capillary pressure, then you have lack of blood flow, you start to get ischemic damage, and then you start to get a pressure injury. Um, can also be contributed to, well, occlusion, tearing a small blood vessel, shear injury, um, especially in older patients that have very thin skin. Um, again, all this contributes to reduced pressure perfusion, ischemic necrosis, and then skin breakdown, and that develops the wound. And so you get this well, cycle of if you, if you don't prevent it or be protective of the pressure, you, the, that's, you get the deeper wound. You, you lose the superficial skin, and then you start to get deeper necrosis and, and all the way down to the bone if, if, if you don't uh, stop that cycle. So factors, what can we control, what can't we control? So extrinsic factors, um, pressure, friction, um, Blunt, you know, impact, force, heat, moisture, posture, and then intrinsic factors. Again, immobility, um, elderly patients, stroke patients, uh, paraplegics, um, any type of plegia. Um, sensory loss, neuropathies, uh, di you know, ties into more to diabetic foot ulcers, but it can also be a problem, you know, with with pressure sores as well. Decreased sensation, so you you start to lose that 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 subconscious need to shift your weight because you, you're, sensing, you're sensing that mild discomfort that happens when you're sitting in the same position for too long. Age is a factor, ties into the previous reasons a little bit. Immobility with age, sensory loss with age. Um, underlying disease processes, so diabetes, obesity, um, again, things that have less, left people immobile, strokes, paraplegias, or any plegias. Body types, again, obesity, larger patient, immobile patient, more pressure. Um, malnutrition and incontinence ties into the moisture component um, and macerated, macerated raw tissue, uh, more prone to pressure injury. What do you say? This is a redundant one, thank you. This is a redundant one, I was just informed. Um, so, but again, kind of looking at this slide and, and, and and uh, intrinsic, extrinsic factors. Um, 
a lot of a lot of what we can control is 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 well positioning, padding, being very cognizant in the pressure points, so the bony prominences. Pa patients that are supine or laying down most of the time, it's mostly the sacrum. That's where their that's their bony prominence when they're laying flat. Sometimes a lot of people don't realize it. The scapulas, the shoulders, when you're laying flat, that's a bony prominence. In a more sitting position, so wheelchair uh, dependent patients or you know, a lot, of, a lot of elderly patients that we see in wound clinic are, they spend the majority of their day sitting in their, in their, in their recliner or their easy chair. So the, the bony prominence there is the, is the ischiums and the, the trochanters on the, on the thighs. Um, so being cognizant of, of the prone areas, the pressure injury, and the position that patient's in most of the time helps, helps us find ways to limit and prevent uh, skin breakdown. So we stage, like a lot of things in medicine, we have stages. So stage one is, 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 is basically no skin breakdown yet. You see discoloration, you see um, the non-blanching erythema. It is often tender uh, to touch, uh, can be warm, but the skin is intact. There's no open wound. Um, and this is, a, this is a, the, the thigh area overlying the trochanter. Stage two, you start to get skin breakdown. Uh, partial thickness, you know, usually have some deeper layer of dermis still, uh, still, still intact. Very shallow ulcer, sometimes can just be like a, almost look like a little, little, uh, little blister, you know, fluid filled blister. Um, that, that's a stage two pressure injury, you're starting to get skin breakdown. Stage three, you've lost the dermis. So your full thickness, you're, you're down to underlying subcutaneous fat. Um, there, there's no deeper structure, um, so no bone or muscle exposed with the stage three ulcer. And then stage four is full thickness, skin, subcutaneous tissue, you have exposed musculoskeletal structure. So you have exposed bone, tendon, muscle, um, and, and the, these are obviously the most difficult to, to, to take care of and to get to heal. And, and, then if, and these are the ones that ultimately they can be fatal. And it's, again, it's not that they die because they got a stage four ulcer. They die from long course, not healing, osteomyelitis. It's a, it's a, slow, it's a slow decline. And then they're, sometimes they're unstageable. So if, if you have, usually these are at least stage three, if not four, is you, just, you have enough necrotic tissue still in the wound that we need to debride or clean up slowly with with wound care, um, and and you can't quite get an accurate stage yet because of the the necrotic tissue burden in 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 the wound, and but that declares itself with time. And then deep tissue injury, it, it's it's usually the so this is basically an early pressure injury that's probably going to break down into something deeper. It's just it's just early in the. The, the injury has occurred, but you still have the intact dermis. You have a lot more bruising component to it. Um, with time, usually fast forward a week from that photo on the, on the right, and you're going to have necrotic skin that's going to need to be debrided. And then usually this necrotic subcutaneous tissue that's all slimy and um, just, it usually ends up being at least a stage three or stage four ulcer. It's just that, 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 that actual tissue, the tissue is damaged to the point that it's going to die, but it, it takes time to declare itself, basically. So, um, position statements. These are FYIs? Okay, so these are things you can read about from, uh, what is the AP, UAP? So that's the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. Um, Guidelines, recommendations to um, guide you in well. One, documenting pressure injury, and 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 then uh, and then also that third one stands out to me that it's it's um, it's not always it's you don't oftentimes when you get a pressure ulcer you're already at the deepest stage. It's not it's not like you start with a stage one and then and then it go it gets to stage four. It can, but usually if you identify a stage one pressure ulcer, you start implementing implementing strategies to prevent it from getting worse and taking care of it and it heals. If you get a stage four, it's, it's usually that deep tissue injury that that 
the damage has already been done. It just hasn't broken down yet, and, and you just don't see the bone in the base of the wound yet because of the overlying tissue necrosis. More position statements. So, um, most pressure injuries are avoidable. Um, but not always, obviously. Um, so th there are the main things we can control, again, is, is moisture, patient positions, um, especially for more of an outpatient role. I mean, in the hospital, it's, it's about being diligent about repositioning patients that can't do it on their own, making sure that if, if a patient is immobile, um, they're, on, they're on a uh, pressure-reducing mattress. Um, skin examinations frequently um, to pick up on evidence of pressure injury at an early stage, because if we find it earlier, it's obviously um, well, a better situation because we can rectify the underlying causes and prevent it from developing into a stage three or a stage four ulcer. Um, things that we, that are, are tougher to control is, is, well, if they have bad vascular disease contributing to a neuropathy, progress, you know, diabetic um, microvascular disease that we can't really fix, even though we're trying to maintain better control of their blood sugars, those are factors that are, that are, that are really tough to, to, to do anything about. Um, What's the first pressure research source? Yeah, so even though we have better technology as far as weight distributing mattresses and all that, it still doesn't replace turning, repositioning, and 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 getting getting moving the patient. So as a physician, our roles, I mean, most of wound care and is nursing care in my and that's that that, that those you are the nursing staff. Um, the care techs are the ones that are providing most of the day in and out care. As physicians, um, well, we, 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 well, we validate the injury, document the injury. Um, obviously, we're part of the team, support, um, and all that. But most of the day in and out care is, is, is on the, uh, by the excellent nursing staff. So our interventions. So again, top of the list is turning, repositioning. Uh, mattress overlays is, is probably the simplest mattress we have. It's basically an air cushion that goes over the mattress. Chair cushions for people that tend to, to spend that time in their, in their recliner and, and, and lounge chair at home or even in the hospital. For distal thing, you know, for diabetic foot ulcers and, and, uh, or, or even vascular ulcers in the, in the extremities, um, protective boots um, are also helpful. The moisture component, you know, is just making sure that you know if somebody is incontinent or of stool or or urine that that they are they are we're changing. We're using skin barrier creams to to keep the skin protected and dry, um, and then and, and if needed, sometimes catheters to 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 obviously not have patients sitting in, in wet undergarments. And then friction and shearing is, is being careful with, with changing the positions that we're, we're not, you know, we, you know, slide boards, mats that we use to, to transfer patients more easily so that we're not, we're not getting that shear force right on the skin. Um, and then sometimes, you know, the, the protective dressings that we use a lot of times, the Mepilexes, um, well, we mostly use Mepilexes here. We don't use Duoderm anymore, but that, that provides a... A slight cushion protects that skin, gives gives a sliding surface that's not the skin, that helps prevent those shear injuries. Um, and then these these are these are things we use both in the hospital and at home. Um, and then nutrition plays a key part in in any healing process, but especially wound healing. Um, if a patient is malnourished, um, they don't have the building blocks they need to 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 heal a wound. Um, and that, tie, that also ties into, you know, the patients that are most at risk, elderly, infirm, sick, diabetic, you know, tend, tend to not have the best nourishment. So um, for, extremity, for any extremity wound, so our top, our top five treatments in wound clinic, 
I think I tell every single patient I see with a venous stasis ulcer that they need to use compression. So um, for that's, again, that's extremity wounds, venous stasis ulcers, especially lymphedema, um, key, part of the, key part of prevention is, and healing is to get the swelling out of the leg. So we use various either tuber grips, which are just um, socks, wraps. Um, the fancy one on the right is, a, is basically a, a compression sock, but it, it's for people that have trouble getting the compression sock on. So the, the sock part is tight, and then the, then the part that comp- provides the compression on the, on the calf is actually a series of Velcro wraps. Um, debreeding, so medical grade honey, it's, it's actually a, it's so for wounds that are a little, have a little bit of necrosis but don't need sharp debridement, um, it's just a, it's a salve that we can use that, that enzymatically debreeds the wound slowly. Um, we, that's a common thing we use in wound clinic. And then dressings, if the Mepilex is a nice dressing, it's, it's, it can stay on for several days at a time, typically change three times a week. Easy for patients to take care of themselves for the most part, uh, depending on the location. Provides that nice balance between protecting the wound, keeping it in that nice middle ground where wounds heal better in a slightly moist, moist environment than a desiccated environment. Um, and uh, again, easy for patients to take care of and, and only needs to be changed like three times a week. And then for, for uh, Lymphedema, uh, it's a pump. We, uh, it's a big pneumatic uh, either pants or sleeve, even comes up under the trunk if, if we need it to come up that high and they, they wear it twice a day for an hour at a time to pneumatically compress the limb and, and get better lymphatic drainage of the affected limb. And then we, we use a lot of wound vacs, so any wound, any full thickness wound, um, we, uh, we can use the wound vac, the advantage of the negative pressure, uh, quicker healing, easier dressing change. You know, if you, if you actually did a traditional wet to dry saline damp or, you know, saline damp dressing and change it three times a day, those studies actually showed that it was equivalent to the wound vac, but you had to do it three times a day. Um, so wound vacs, uh, sponge goes into the wound, transparent dressing seals it, it's attached to the pump. Um, it's changed three times a week. And uh, so e- ease of care, uh, promotes granulation tissue and wound wound healing, promotes uh, vascular neogenesis, um, and it controls the drainage. So wounds that are a little bit a little bit wet yet, a little bit infected, or, or have higher higher drainage, it's a it's a great way to control that drainage and promote healing. A little bit newer, I forget exactly. I use this fairly frequently. Um, it's a it's the bottom right one. It's a pico dressing. So that's actually an incisional vac. So it's it's for can be used for superficial wounds though too. Um, it's, it, that's a dressing that you either put on a closed incision on an obese patient or especially after a surgery where there is feculent peritonitis or, or any type of peritonitis where you're worried about wound infection, you can actually close the incision completely and then, then put a pico on it and it stays on for seven days at a time. It doesn't have a big reservoir though, so it really, it actually, the, it, it wicks the fluid to the surface and it evaporates, so you can't use it on, you can't use it on wounds that have high volume fluid output. Um, and then, uh, it, but it does work nicely for some superficial wounds, even sometimes over skin grafts. I, it's, a, it's probably one of my favorite new gadgets, but. Uh, and then that's, I think, a, a kind of a summary statement of, of the challenges of, of wound care. A lot of factors play into it. Um, again, the, the, a, lot of, a, a lot of what we can do is prevention. Be, just don't even, just be ahead of the curve and not be trying to catch up after we have a, after we have a stage three or stage four pressure ulcer. And final thoughts, again, cheapest, the cheapest wound is no wound. Uh, the cheapest, next cheapest wound is a heel wound. Documentation is important. It's about, um, well, one, showing that we're doing what we need to do to prevent wounds, documenting them when we find them early, and then documenting that the interventions that we are taking are, are showing improvement in, in healing. And then know your resources, mainly Jamie and the wound care team. Um, and again, prevention is the first step. Some references. Any questions?
So I either really sucked or I really did good. Okay, testing, testing, everybody can hear me okay? Uh, so first off, hello. Uh, thanks everybody for coming in. We appreciate you carving out time. I think that was a wonderful presentation and uh, I think that's gonna lead really nicely into just talking a little bit more about hyperbaric therapy today. So first off, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Dan Christopher. I'm a nurse from Pittsburgh, PA. Um, how did I get into hyperbaric medicine? I've been a nurse for about 20 years, and about 10 years ago, I fell into it purely by accident. Um, had the, I've had the fortune to work in a really fun hyperbaric program where we treated outpatient hyperbarics. We also did inpatient hyperbaric therapy, emergency indications, and also pediatrics. So. When I talked today about some of the indications, um, I was fortunate in getting to see some of this in some of the more dramatic cases. Um, my role with Restorix Health, um, that's really my only disclosure. I'm a full-time employee of Restorix Health, um, but I'm the director of implementation and HBO training. So I get to work with a team of great people in making sure every program has support from a hyperbaric quality education and training perspective, not just for opening, but also after the program's open uh, for day-to-day -day support, you know, as uh, patient challenges come up. So, and, and have a lot of fun doing it. So once again, thanks for the invitation. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a fancy term. Basically all it means is high pressure oxygen. And as you just learned, you know, your patients are getting a wonderful resource here. Um, they're gonna have a new program. Not every patient that walks through the door of your center is going to need hyperbaric oxygen therapy. But as you were learning about the more advanced wound care modalities, the ability to do those advanced modalities for patients that need it, that really sets your program apart. Hyperbarics is another piece of that puzzle. So when we talk today about hyperbarics, you know, a percentage of these patients in the center, uh, traditionally with their disease processes, are going to need the therapy. And then there are also patients out there that will benefit exclusively from hyperbarics that otherwise may not, would not come to the center as we get into talking about radiation and uh, things like that. But, you know, folks start by saying, what is hyperbaric? So hyperbaric oxygen, just again, high pressure oxygenation. That's all it is. The chamber is a delivery device. So when you put a patient into the chamber, they're pressurized. You know, right now we're talking to each other, we're interacting at one atmosphere, the atmosphere that we live at. Um, when your patient goes into a chamber, the chamber actually increases pressure to two to three atmospheres. So it multiplies the atmospheres on top of the patient. And that pressure allows us to drug the patient which, with whatever gas they're breathing, which in this case is pure medicinal grade oxygen. So in the hyperbaric industry, folks spend a lot of time debating which patients benefit from HBO and, and at what stage HBO should be introduced into the disease process. But we really can't debate if hyperbarics does anything because it's physics driven. It's all physics gas laws. I'm not gonna sit here and go over every physics gas law with you. We will talk a little bit about Henry's law, which I think is one of the neater examples. Uh, but it's the same physiology that applies to patients or to people that go scuba diving. Um, some of the same laws of physics that uh, affect you when you fly in an airplane. Uh, interestingly enough, airplanes are essentially flying hyperbaric chambers. So again, it's, uh, it's when you understand the physics, it starts to make a lot more sense about why we treat certain disease processes in certain patients with hyperbaric medicine. One of the laws I like to think about is Henry's law. And Henry's law really just states that increasing pressure on a gas is going to dissolve more of that gas into the solution proportionally. But the reason I like to talk about Henry's law is you can observe it in reverse. If you go to the vending machine, you pick out a brand new bottle of Coca-Cola, what happens as soon as you open it? It's gonna foam, it's gonna fizz. Where did that fizz come from? You know, a second ago, that bottle was sealed and there was no gas that you could see coming out of that solution. But as soon as you open that bottle, it foams up. Why did that happen? That's Henry's law. The solution, so when they bottle soda, they do it with carbon dioxide, because we like it fizzy, and they bottle it under a much higher pressure. So that's a sealed up bottle with a hyper, kind of think about it as hyperbaric conditions. There's more CO2 dissolved in the solution. Then you open the Coke, it's time to pour it into a glass. And at that point, suddenly bubbles appear from nowhere because you've dropped the pressure dramatically when you open the bottle. The bottle, that fluid is now exposed to our atmosphere. It's less pressure. And in reverse, because you've reduced the pressure, that solution, that gas comes out of the solution. So 
Henry's law is really kind of a neat way to observe that phenomenon. So in a hyperbaric patient, think of them as inside that pop bottle, except they're going into a hyperbaric chamber. It's going to pressurize them, and it's, as they breathe pure medicinal grade oxygen, they're going to absorb a much higher percentage of oxygen into their bloodstream than otherwise they would be able to. Um, so essentially, hyperbarics allows us to deliver oxygen to the patient as a drug. Right now, we're breathing air. There's 21% oxygen. We can put a mask on. We can put a non-rebreather on, one of the patient care rooms. We can breathe oxygen. And that's going to increase the amount of oxygen in our system, um, but it's not going to get our oxygen levels anywhere near if we were to breathe that oxygen under pressure. And these are the clinical pressures that we achieve in a hyperbaric chamber. Towards the back end of the presentation, I'll talk a little more about what a patient can expect uh, who goes in the chamber, who's a candidate for hyperbaric therapy. Just a quick preview here. Um, really, the only major downside to the therapy is time. It is a big time commitment. And the reason is we drug the patient with oxygen for several hours, varies between about two to two and a half hours a day. Some of the more extreme indications, they actually need multiple treatments a day. Um, but then the question becomes, if you, you know, and what are we doing when they're in the chamber? We're hyperoxygenating them. Uh, what we find with a lot of these chronic wounds is oxygen supply is almost always an issue. Blood supply is almost always an issue. Hyperbarics isn't going to work if there's no blood supply whatsoever. That's why our centers have a partner in vascular. We have to make sure that the wound has at least some degree of marginal flow. But once we determine that it does, we're going to achieve much higher levels of oxygen in the wound through that diseased blood supply by putting the patient in the chamber every day. So the question becomes then, if we do it every day, why doesn't the patient need hyperbarics forever? How do they heal? Well, as we expose the patient to these higher levels of pressure day in and day out, day after day after day, usually for 20 or 30 treatments, that's a typical cycle. The, the, end, the end game is that we want the body to actually you know, achieve angiogenesis. We want to grow new blood vessels into that wound. Uh, and that's, that's typically how the patient recovers and how the patient heals. That's sometimes that missing piece of the puzzle that hyperbarics helps to achieve. Um, it does a lot of other neat stuff too. So, you know, we think about it. One, we immediately hyperoxygenate the patient. Two, as we do this over and over, we want to stimulate angiogenesis into the wound. Um, but there are, we, we also find in some of these disease indications that it can regiment the immune response, it can help with leukocyte phagocytosis, um, it can help with the release of growth factors. There's still a lot we're learning and studying about hyperbaric medicine, um, but a lot, depending on the disease we're treating, a lot of other think, neat things it does, including it also reduces bubble diameter, which not a big deal in a wound patient. Um, I'll talk briefly later about decompression sickness and air embolisms, um, but in those cases, the bubble's an issue. And reducing that, I should say not diameter, but reducing that volume of the bubble helps the body achieve uh, healing as well. So it does a lot of neat things, but again, take home points. The patient has to be in a chamber. Uh, they're in the chamber for a sustained period of time, usually 90 to 120 minutes. We follow very strict clinical protocols. Uh, and again, it's, it's getting therapy every day for usually five days a week, usually four to six weeks. And this is part of what we discussed during the consent process with the patient uh, in partnering with them to get them healed. And again, it works because of physics uh, and some of these gas laws. And uh, there's a lot of literature out there. There are websites devoted to hyperbarics. There's you know, scientific bodies that discuss this. So if you want to learn more, you can get as deep in the weeds on physics and gas laws as you like. But again, medical treatment, it's pure oxygen. Important to know. No, we're not filling the chamber with air. We're filling the chamber with pure oxygen. Again, we're achieving clinical pressures two to three times greater than atmospheric pressure. Uh, and again, this allows us to saturate the patient. This is kind of a neat fact. We put so much oxygen in the patient, it actually ends up in their plasma. So we know traditionally the, the body can only transport oxygen on hemoglobin. But we've actually proven when they're in the chamber that oxygen spills into the plasma just while they're in chamber. Um, but it would super saturate them. And that is how we manage to get so much more oxygen into a wound bed that otherwise has a marginal or diseased blood supply and even, in, in, even increase the uh, capillary diffusion distance that we're pushing that oxygen out into the tissue. Um, now, unfortunately, one thing that does hurt the hyperbaric field a little bit is there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and there's products out there that people use and that people sell that do not work. Um, so if you poke around on the internet long enough, you're going to stumble across topical oxygen therapy. There is no such thing. 
So, you know, it stands to reason, okay, I've got a wound on my foot that needs to be treated. Can I just put my, wo- my foot into a hyperbaric chamber? And that's what these little chambers you, they buy on eBay are designed to do. But we don't absorb the oxygen in hyperbarics through our skin. It's not absorbed topically. The oxygen is absorbed when we breathe pressurized gas under pressure. We supersaturate hematogenously. It happens in the lungs. It happens at the gas exchange level. So sticking my foot into a box that's pressurized isn't going to do anything. Patients may ask that too, and that's why it's helpful for the staff to be able to talk through that with the patient. Um, you also may hear about altitude bags. They're soft shell hyperbaric chambers. So when you, you, when you get a chance to tour the unit, when everything's done, you're going to see the big fancy hyperbaric chambers, you know, big tubes, 36 inches in diameter, something like that, that the patient lays in. But you can buy these little bags. So folks say, well, isn't that the same thing? And they're not. The bags are designed for decompression sickness. Um, you know, if you're a mountain climber, you can deploy an altitude bag and it adds just a tiny bit of pressure um, to help with that sickness, but it doesn't achieve clinical pressures even close to what the chambers that you're going to get do. Um, so again, we follow pretty strict clinical protocols, scientifically driven, and we achieve very significant clinical pressures by disease indication that help these patients to heal. Now, high, high pressure, pressurized oxygen is a fire hazard, so safety is a big deal. We take safety very, very seriously. The staff, the providers, everybody goes through fairly exhaustive and intensive hyperbaric training. Anyone that's going to operate a chamber uh, is, learns all about our policy and procedure set. Uh, I'm a big fan of checklists. You see checklists used in a lot of different places in medicine. We use a lot of checklists in the unit, talk about um, making sure devices are cleared, making sure everything is done consistently and appropriately before we start that treatment. You can think about it as you know things like pre-procedural pauses and things like that. So, But you find when we follow our strict policy and procedure, we follow our checklists, our safe operating guidelines, good education, good training for the techs, and they know the, who they can reach out to with questions. HBO is extremely safe and extremely effective uh, for these patients when they partner with us to show up every day and to do their part to heal. So the next question is often, which patients would benefit from hyperbarics? You know, Dr. Capitorto is our chief medical officer. He's been in the game a long time. He's been known to say, and I agree, um, all chronic wounds would benefit from hyperoxygenation. When we think about the disease process in a lot of these chronic wounds, hypoxic conditions in and around the wound is almost always at least a, a factor. You know, depending on what the organism is, what the bug, what kind of infection, um, it stands to reason adding oxygen, more oxygen to the equation wouldn't be a bad thing. That said, we're not approved to do HBO for any chronic wound. I think in a perfect world, our providers would have much more discretion over referring a patient for HBO as they deem it appropriate. Um, with insurance guidelines, currently we follow the indications, um, so we are a little more limited in who benefits. But that said, even following the payer guidelines, there's a lot of patients out there and a lot of services which will encounter these patients. So I'll talk a little on the next slide um, about the, some of the disease indications, but thinking about them now, it's kind of surprising how many services can see these patients. Again, when you think about some of the more traditional indications, um, there are certain services that you traditionally partner with the center. So general surgery, again, may be handling very complex wounds in the OR, debridements, things like that, perhaps crush injuries, trauma, all kinds of wounds for all kinds of reasons. Um, so we, we always find a friend in general surgery with the center, but podiatry, of course, also handling complex foot wounds, extremely complex foot wounds, charcoal's foot, things like that, where you know, we're almost always looking at amputation if something's not done. Uh, so we partner with podiatry. We see, you know, they see a lot of these complex wounds. They learn very quickly which patients would benefit from wound center services. Plastic surgery, we have a friend in plastics. Um, plastic surgeons do a, a pretty incredible job of reattaching tissue, grafts and flaps. But depending on where the tissue is or the nature of the, how it was injured, whether it was ripped off, what the reattachment is, can be very complex on whether that graft takes. Uh, so we, we do want to make our services available to plastic surgeons. And I'll talk a little more in the next slide about kind of some of the neat stuff I've seen in the plastic surgery world. Family practice, we find a lot of family practice docs, particularly before a big program opens, may be already doing wound care officially or unofficially in their office for patients as it's needed. Um, so we partner with them. Of course, we, we partner with vascular. Vascular seeing a lot of wounds that are related to blood supply. And as I mentioned before, we've got to have some degree of blood supply to that patient's wound, even if it's marginal for them to benefit from HBO. So that's another really important partner in the program. But services that you might not expect. 
Um, again, when we talk about radiation injury, a lot of times these are wounds on the inside of the body that we can't see. So when a, when a provider sees that patient, they may not be thinking about your wound center, but when we, we work with them and educate them about the reasons for HBO, sometimes those gears start turning and they realize they're seeing our patients. So as I'll talk on the next slide about radiation, you know, radiation cystitis, maybe urology is managing that patient. Maybe they're on your med surge unit for continuous bladder irrigation. That's a patient that would benefit from HBO services. Gastroenterology might see patients with radiation enteritis. Radiation oncology may be seeing patients with complex wounds and burns that have progressed beyond six months out. Um, oral surgery, dentistry. Uh, we'll talk about osteoradionecrosis, the nature of the disease process in the jaw. They're seeing these patients as well. And as you think about some of the other complex indications, particularly on the inpatient side, you start to realize virtually any service can encounter a patient. So your program's gonna have a lot of patients in the patient census who traditionally you know, are gonna meet criteria. Not all of them, but some of them are gonna meet criteria for HBO. But again, you also may have services that only need to refer to your program just for HBO. Urology might just need to refer that patient just for that radiation cystitis. There's nothing externally you're gonna do with that wound, but they're still gonna benefit from the hyperbarics. So again, talking about the outpatient indications first. Uh, tra you know, traumatic peripheral ischemia. Anything where you're dealing with you know, you're, you're dealing with an insult to the limb, you're dealing with a crush injury, you're dealing with a reattachment of a limb, something complex, or maybe a limb was reattached from trauma in the past, but you have kind of a chronic compartment syndrome, anything like that. Um, these are patients that would potentially benefit from hyperbarics. And obviously, when I say that, especially in traumatic cases, we're partnering with surgery. Um, HBO is not a replacement for surgery. We're working with the team, we're working with the OR. Um, it is another piece that we're adding to the puzzle to try to get this patient to turn the corner and to heal. Um, diabetic wounds, that's a traditional indication. Now, unfortunately, we're limited in which diabetics would benefit. So traditionally, typically what you'll find is most payers, Medicare included, are going to deem HBO appropriate for a Wagner grade three or higher. And all that really means is this is a pretty complex, catastrophic diabetic wound. By the time they achieve three on the Wagner scale, often they have abscess, gangrene, or osteo on the wound. So this is a nasty wound. And you know, some, some folks might be starting to talk about amputation. That is, it is at that stage after we've done good, good care, and despite our good care, the patient has progressed to this stage three, that HBO becomes an indication. And what's neat is even with the limitations the payers put on HBO, we still achieve pretty great success with a lot of these patients when they get to stage three. And I mentioned, again, we add HBO to the equation, we need to keep doing the other good care. We need to keep doing good sugar control. We need to keep doing good nutrition. We need to keep doing good wound care. But again, we're adding HBO to the puzzle. Again, perfect world. I think, hey, if it works at stage three, why can't we do it at stage two before it gets that severe? But again, what you'll find is you know, most payers are going to limit that. Now and again, a commercial payer will approve a patient for stage two. But traditionally right now, stage three and above is what's indicated. And again, acute peripheral arterial insufficiency, thinking about that hyperoxygenation, anytime the wound flow is damaged to a limb or a digit, again, we, we can, in the short term, hyperoxygenate that tissue through the chamber while, we, while that patient develops collateral circulation or whether other, while other interventions occur. Uh, some really neat cases that my program had seen in the past, unfortunate, but kind of neat, good outcome for the patient, um, when you had arterial inj injury because of an external intervention. So we had a child who accidentally received from an outlying facility, received an in IM injection, but it was that one in a million IM and they had not aspirated. And when they did the injection, they just happened to hit an artery, didn't know it pushed drug into an artery. So now you have a child's limb that's compromised, cyanotic. Not, you, know, you have a major insult to a major artery into that limb. By doing HBO, even twice a day for that kid, we were able to save that limb. Case I saw personally was a baby um, that had um, accidentally had a dextrose infusion into an artery that was thought to be venous. And by the time HBO got the consult, the child's hand was like a little balloon, had ulnar occlusion. Um, and again, I'm telling you some extreme stories. We did some extreme stuff where I came from. Um, 50 plus treatments later, that child had ulnar patency and we were able to save most of the hand. Um, still an unfortunate circumstance, uh, but again, really kind of neat to see that angiogenesis and how we help to hyperoxygenate and help that limb. So acute peripheral arterial insufficiency can present in a number of ways. Going back to skin grafts, um, you're gonna have folks who have planned and unplanned flaps and grafts. Uh, so we do, put, we like to partner with the plastics team if they've done a graft, things have not gone as planned for whatever reason. If we get the patient in the chamber quickly, they can benefit from HBO. And what's really neat is in some cases, 
you know, if this tissue is cyanotic and dusky right off the bat, you can actually see the color change. I used to treat a lot of kids with plastic grafts. Um, I'm kind of nuts about dog bites. They used to refer all the time. Nose, lip, ear, sometimes the entire top of the head would get ripped off by the dog. They would reattach, call us sometimes as these kids were going into surgery. And we would do twice a day therapy. And these children, you would lend you, this is the same with an adult, but you, you would see the tissue literally coming out pink. It went in cyanotic and dusky and they were coming out pink. We would have to take photos and send back to the clinical team and say, listen, even if by the time they get back to you, it's dusky again, it's working, it's, it's changing color, we need to keep this up. So. Um, again, that's an extreme example, but even in the outpatient center, you're going to have, you know, you may have cases where plastics need you, uh, planned or unplanned. I've seen, you know, planned plastic surgeries where they just know they're operating on very tenuous tissue and thinking ahead of time, we might need a little hyperbarics just to help that patient through. Chronic refractory osteo, you know, I discussed that osteo is an indicator within diabetics, within that Wagner scale, but standalone refractory osteo is also an indication for hyperbarics. So by refractory, of course, we have, to, we have to demonstrate through our documentation, we have to tell the story. This is a patient who was diagnosed with osteo for whatever reason, whether it's a bed sore or a complex traumatic injury, something else, we did good care. We diagnosed the bug, if surgery, we did surgery if necessary, we did antibiotics, we did everything right, and even still, we re-diagnosed and there is still osteo in the wound, however many weeks later. At that point, the patient becomes refractory osteo, and at that point, HBO is indicated to add to that puzzle. Again, we wanna help, we keep doing all the other good care we're doing, but we wanna help that patient turn the corner for osteo. Osteoradionecrosis, another big indication. Now, I'm, as I talk about radiation, I'm getting into patients that may not be referred to the center for direct wound care, but they're going to benefit from the HBO. Uh, you know, as we think about radiation, obviously the good news about radiation is it, it saves the patient's life. So in a lot of cases, the patient has a cancer, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation may be a part of that regimen. Medicine's advanced quite a bit. So the radiation fields have shrunk considerably now. When we radiate a tumor, we do a much better job of not accidentally damaging collateral tissue that we didn't want to radiate than we did decades ago. But even still, there is still some collateral damage. And a percent of those patients that that good healthy tissue gets exposed to radiation just as circumstantially because it was around the tumor, some of those patients, not all, will go on to develop radiation injury. And the issue with radiation is over, and when I talk about radiation injury, HBO is not approved for short term. It's approved for injury for radiation that's occurring beyond six months out. So you, you, sometimes you expect skin burns and things like that within the first six months, and that is not an indication. But if again, if they have a disease process that's progressed, or in some of these radiation cases, the disease does not show up until months to years to decades later. Again, because the radiation over time can help, they call it radiated, ra um, obliterative endarditis, causes the lining of the blood vessel to overgrow and kind of thicken, and you end up with a, th a thin, narrow lumen of blood supply to the wound. And when that happens, again, the patient develops dysfunction. They may not have seen it coming. If, it's, if it was a pelvic tumor and radiation field was here and it hit the bladder and we didn't realize it, they just suddenly one day may start to have bleeding into their urine and clots. Um, in the case of osteoradionecrosis, this is jaw issue. So what we find is there's a lot of head and neck cancers. There are actually some alarming research coming out about HPV and how it can silent HPV in the throat or in the head and neck region can cause tonsillar cancer. We're seeing it in young adult males. Uh, but whatever the reason for the cancer, you know, part of the regimen included that radiation. So these patients now, years later, can go on. Some of them will develop osteoradionecrosis, which is just a fancy term for death of the jawbone due to radiation. Uh, it's a horrible condition. It can develop spontaneously or from surgery. So you know, when it develops spontaneously, these are patients that can just one day notice they've got a hole through the bottom of their mouth, or they just start to develop exposed bone in the jaw, inside their mouth. Um, surgery is really important here, and there's obviously there's staging for osteo. There's early osteo with resorption, microfracture, all the way through really advanced osteo. We saw some really sad cases where patients actually had to have their entire jaw removed. Um, leech therapy, all kinds of really complex stuff going on down here with sloughing tissue. But again, HBO is an indication. When you think about it, the, the other thing I should mention is that osteo can also be caused by surgery. So what happens in a lot of classic cases is a patient had radiation decades ago, and one of the things the radiation did was kind of fried the salivary glands, and the patient develops chronic dry mouth, and over the course of years, that helps to rot out the teeth. So the patient arrives at a dentist or an oral surgeon needing to have teeth extracted. 
Um, a lot of savvy dentists and oral surgeons that know the history will often be hesitant to do that surgery without including hyperbarics to hyperoxygenate, knowing that once they pull those teeth, it's going to cause a little bit of a surgical insult to a jaw, which already doesn't have a great blood supply. Because what happens otherwise, in a lot of cases, you pull the tooth, they develop kind of a dry socket and exposed bone, which then starts to progress and go backwards instead of healing, and they progress into ORN. So again, it can be spontaneous. It can develop from surgery. Uh, some payers will cover HBO preventatively. It's called Mark's Protocol. Uh, Medicare does not, but um, that is a recent change. But if you had done HBO prior to extracting teeth and then after, you know, the goal is to never have that wound to begin with. Um, you, can, you can do that way. And in other cases, unfortunately, you know, we see patients who have already progressed into ORN, and they're candidates. So they may come to the center. Nothing else may get done at the center except that HBO. Um, but it's really good to let the oral surgeons and dentists in our community know about that service being available for those patients. As I touch base on, uh, this can happen anywhere in the body. Um, we've seen patients, again, with radiation in the bladder, huge quality of life stuff. Sometimes urology is looking to take in the bladder out. They've tried formula and they've tried all kinds of stuff. Patient is just not healing. They're in and out of the hospital with continuous bladder irrigation. They're up all night. They can't void. They're in pain. They're in agony. We see some really neat recoveries. Um, again, because we're trying to hyperoxygenate through that disease, radiation disease blood supply, and then we want the patient to grow new collateral circulation. So uh, you're, again, as I mentioned the services in the previous slide, even anal ulcers, vaginal ulcers, there's, there's really no rule, just depending on where this patient was radiated and as long as it's been more than six months out, um, anywhere that they're having disease process that's felt to be related at least partially to radiation, they become a candidate for HBO. Now, we get a lot of questions about the inpatient and high acuity side. Now, this is stuff I did. I will tell you a lot of wound centers... Um, ask about treating these patients. And we want to help our patients, but these are very complex patients. And the problem is, an outpatient center, you're not, you're not going to be able to manage these patients. They often require cardiac monitoring. These are ICU telemetry level patients. They're probably on drips. They may be in multi-system organ failure, and they're often intubated. Uh, but there are centers that do manage these kind of patients. Uh, HBO is helpful for acute carbon monoxide. This is a, a very unfortunate thing that happens everywhere, every year, particularly in the winter from generator usage, things like that. I won't spend too much time on it, but carbon monoxide binds up the hemoglobin more, better than oxygen does. Um, those patients end up with hypoxia. So hyperbarics helps them to shed the carbon monoxide and kind of re-hyperoxygenate them, particularly the brain. Decompression illness, these are divers. We talked about Henry's Law. These are divers with a high nitrogen load that come to the surface too fast. They miss a stop um, without getting into too much dive medicine. They have a bubble causing problems in their body anywhere from collateral circulation, from central circulation to in their elbow, causing elbow pain. Again, because we're reducing the volume of the bubble and we're changing the composition from nitrogen to oxygen, which helps the body resorb it, better deal with it. Um, gas embolism, this is often surgical in nature. Uh, we're working with central lines in our patients or you know, cardiac surgery, taking patients on and off bypass. There's a lot of reasons this can happen to patients. Uh, but again, you know, it can be iatrogenic, but this is an issue where there's a bubble somewhere in the body it shouldn't be. And it's causing hypoxia. Um, depending on where it's at, it can cause pretty grave symptoms in the patient. But again, the same mechanism for HBO as decompression illness. I think, in my mind, gas gangrene and progressive necrotizing infections go hand in hand. Uh, we call a lot of things necrotizing fasciitis, and what is it? Is it group A strep? Is it clostridium? Is it aerobic? Is it anaerobic? When you get into some of these anaerobes that cause, produce gas in the tissue, some really neat stuff starts to happen with HBO. Now, first thing I'm going to say is, you, you obviously, surgery is hallmark. We don't, we don't mess with that. So the centers that do treat for this are competing with surgery, that when the, when the patient's not in the OR, that's when they're trying to schedule their HBO time. But they're finding in some of the bugs that cause these runaway catastrophic infections, HBO will actually halt alpha toxin production, which is like akin to snake bite venom and what it's doing to the patient. So really kind of neat. And even in aerobic cases, it can be very, very useful in supporting surgery and supporting everything else the hospital's doing to save the patient and helping to save that limb. But again, the issue you run into at the outpatient center is these patients, by the time this is recognized, are often incredibly critically ill. They have filleted limbs, they're in the ICU, um, they're beyond the acuity of an outpatient center. But the, the, uh, hype, the medicine is, is pretty sound behind how the hyperbarics works. I should have also mentioned burns. 
which kind of goes hand in hand with cyanide poisoning. So burns, you know, the, the issue with burn patients is that they're often at burn centers, which are understandably very reluctant to move that patient and transfer them out of the center. Um, so you don't see a lot of burn patients with access to HBO, but it is indicated for burns. And cyanide poisoning, interestingly enough, comes from smoke inhalation frequently. So when you're dealing with, it's the centers that deal with carbon monoxide deal with smoke inhalation and all this great stuff we have in our houses now, all these laminate products, um, all these synthetic materials, when we burn them, they produce cyanide. So you often witness smoke inhalation patients that present concordant or, you know, at the same concomitantly with, uh, with cyanide poisoning. So hyperbarics is also useful for that. But again, these are far beyond um, typically the indications in an outpatient center. So what does the future hold? There's a lot of research in hyperbarics. Now, one of the, one of the issues with hyperbarics is it, you know, it's not as well-funded as pharmacy, for example, but there's still a lot of research going on. Um, they're finding that doing HBO in tandem with ketogenesis and chemo, they're actually looking at uh, does HBO help increase tumor damage? So not a magic bullet by itself, but actually useful in helping with treatment for particular kinds of cancers. These are not approved yet, but these are things that the industry is looking at. Traumatic brain injury, it's hard to overstate just how, how much science is flying around right now on traumatic brain injury, both acute and mild TBI. A lot of this is happening in the veteran population as we speak. There are multiple states with bills going through the Senate actually moving ahead of the industry to fund VA centers to start uh, HBO for TBI on these vets. It's, it's that dramatic. The, the responses in the brain to hyperoxygenating these patients with injured brains. Um, so there's a lot of fascinating science out there on that. Calciphylaxis, some commercial payers cover this now. It's not a formal indication. You know, this is a complex renal disease that leads to an extraordinarily painful wound on the patient. Um, I've, I've been fortunate to actually treat some patients with this, seen some good outcomes, but uh, HBO is indicated there. I throw hepatic artery thrombosis in where I came from. That was a trial we did a long time ago. Kids were rejecting their livers after transplant surgery. Um, and they were finding that doing HBO twice a day on those kids was sustaining oxygen to the liver until they could grow collateral circulation around the hepatic artery and it was saving their liver. So not something you're going to see every day, but kind of neat. Biphosphonate-related osteonecrosis. This is more of a drug-related osteonecrosis that I think is right around the corner from becoming an indication that the science is out there for how HBO is helpful. And again, when you start to think about all this, you start to think, well, geez, what else? You know, they say a lot of trends in human medicine follow veterinary medicine. There's, I couldn't cite them right now. There's around 100 to 130 indications in veterinary medicine for HBO. And we've got you know, 13 to 14 in human medicine. So a lot of things to think about. So moving along, respective to time, what can an HBO patient expect? The main concern a patient's going to have about HBO is that it's boring. Almost every patient that sees the chamber will be nervous about going in until we get a chance to put them in. Once we empower them, we educate them, we show them that when they're in the chamber, they've got a nurse or a technician observing them one-to-one -one at all times and a qualified provider supervising them, they find it's not so bad. Entertainment's really important. I call it the visual advent. We've got to have whatever they want to watch on TV, whether it's Judge Judy or Jerry Springer. They can bring a movie in, but they, you know, they need something to focus on. We're, we're very, there's not a lot of stuff we let them bring in the chamber because of fire safety. We don't want electronics. They can't bring their iPads. So we make an entertainment plan with them before the therapy ever begins. Um, but again, we, we work with them. We educate them during the medical clearance and the consent process, which will happen prior to the starting their treatments, that you know, this is an expected 30 treatment cycle, Monday through Friday. It's shown to be effective when it's done consistently, so we need them to show up on time. Uh, treatments are roughly two to two and a half hours in length. Again, they're gonna go through a thorough and exhaustive medical screening and a medical clearance with the physician or the provider um, to determine that they're safe. There's very few, there are relative contraindications to HBO. The only absolute contraindication is an unresolved pneumothorax. Uh, but the clinical team is going to look at their history prior to uh, referring them in to make sure that everything is safe. As I mentioned, they're going to have one-on-one -on -one skilled care and observation. So the provider will supervise the HBO passively from you know, within the center or wherever med staff defines those limits in the building, on campus, whatever the rule is. But the person operating the chamber cannot leave that room for any reason while a patient's in there. So they are sitting there at the chamber side, communicating with the patient, observing the patient, and making sure that the patient is comfortable. And what you find is the patients really kind of build a trust relationship with the, with the TAC very quickly. Um, and it's, it's kind of a neat thing to see. And again, we tell them this is not going to happen overnight. Um, so if, we, if it's a wound we can see and we do HBO, it's not going to be half healed tomorrow. Through the process of angiogenesis, you know, we expect you know, three, four weeks in. At that point, you might, if, it was a, if it's a wound you can observe, you're looking for the granulation tissue. Side effects are relatively few. 
there are some scary ones. Uh, oxygen is a toxin. Too much oxygen is a toxin to healthy patients. So one in 10,000 patients, even when they follow our strict clinical protocols, may have a seizure. That's a transient condition when it occurs. The team has a procedure they follow to keep everybody safe. There's no long-term ill effect to the patient, but we do warn them about it during consent. But the side effects the patient will likely deal with, they may experience temporary vision changes. Uh, those changes typically resolve you know, six to eight weeks after the last treatment. The oxygen can actually temporarily reshape the corneal lens. Uh, and they can experience barotrauma. They can experience pain in their ears. That's why we need a friend in ENT. When we're seeing these patients, they may need tubes placed. And if you want to experience what they're experiencing, jump in an airplane. Um, when you get up to 30,000 feet, the cockpit is pressurized. I mentioned they're flying hyperbaric chambers, not to the pressures we go to, but you experience the same phenomenons, that pressure in your ears. So we educate the patients on how to yawn and chew and wiggle their jaw and equalize, but a percentage of them may need tubes from ENT, little tiny tubes like kids get, to allow that pressure change to happen automatically. But all in all, uh, it's a pretty mild, gentle therapy, uh, pretty minimal side effects. So that said, uh, just getting ready to wrap up. I know there's a lot of questions. What's going on with the program here? I think a lot of excitement. Um, obviously, we have you know we have a timeline we follow. So you know right now we're in the final phases here in December, moving into the end of the year, finalizing the floor plan. What's the center going to look like? Where are the wound care rooms? Where are the chambers? Where's the oxygen? How's the oxygen get to the chamber? It's all the kind of the stuff that they're going through in the drawings and the floor plans. And then, of course, we move along a timeline. So we assemble those documents, and then we move on to bidding. And then finally, once the bidding's awarded, those hammers start to swing. Once the hammers start swinging, it's usually 60 to 90 days of construction for the center to open. Of course, we have regulatory approval on the back end. What's not mentioned here is all the training that happens. We don't want to train too early. We don't want to do HBO training today and not open for three, four, five months. We, we want to keep that information fresh. So that we'll be doing a ton of HBO training around opening. Most likely we'll host a course here, a 40 hour training course. It's worth 41.5 category one CME. It's good stuff. Hi deep, deep into hyperbaric physiology, probably closer to summer before the HBO service line launches. Again, uh, most likely we'll start seeing patients early summer. And this is flexible. Um, this is the timeline as it stands now. But part of our role with the implementation team is if the timeline changes, we change with it uh, to make sure we're lined up. And I'm told this is the latest version of the floor plan. So again, you have your wound care rooms here. Um, you've got your waiting room here, your front desk operations. Uh, and then, of course, back in here, clean and soiled, nurse's office, nurse's station. Here's the chambers. So here's the HBO suite, as we call it. Patients can change here. They have a bathroom. And then these are the stretchers. Stretchers come out of the chamber, patient gets on the stretcher and it slides into the chamber and you have a technician or a, a staff member who pretty much lives in this room tending to the patients. So uh, really kind of a neat thing once you, once you see that center take shape. And that pretty much takes us through to questions. Are there any questions? Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Yep, yep, so one up there. What is the charge for this? For, for the treatments. So the charge varies t t typically as, you know, going off the top of my head, there's a facility charge and there's a provider charge. So I think traditionally what's billed, and I have to look back, I think in a lot of cases there's, there's a facility bill of, you know, it can be five, $600 a session. HBO is billed in 30 minute sessions. You think it's usually four to five sessions because that includes pressurization time and depressurization time when we're building pressure on the patient and towards the end. So there's a facility charge and then there is a provider supervision fee. Um, and again, all of that, when we get closer to opening, we have a lot of breakout sessions. We have a session with revenue cycle where we want to make sure coding, training, um, you know, charge entry, what does this look like? Um, all the way through clinical operations, making sure we have a policy and procedure set adopted and ready to go for HBO. And again, building our own training timelines for the staff and the providers. So, good question. Any others? Ah, yes. Who needs the training, are you asking? So we train everybody. And part of the reason we do it the way we do it, so the scientific body in hyperbaric medicine is called the Undersea Hyperbaric Medical Society, UHMS. They drive the guidelines that the insurance payers follow for accepted indications. So right now, from a, from a training standpoint, the gold standard in hyperbaric medicine is to go to a UHMS-approved hyperbaric training course. 
And again, I mentioned it's worth 41.5 category one. It is face to face. There is no way around that. So it's about five days long. This is one we would bring and do here in this room most likely. Uh, but you walk out of there, you take an exam and you walk out of there with a certificate. Now for providers, that's typically the gold standard. Now, any other provider requirements are, are subject to whatever med staff has determined, retrospective chart review, anything like that, but that, that certificate is the gold standard. Anyone that's gonna drive a chamber, a, a tech or a nurse, as I call it, um, they have to go on and get competency training. So they get that course, they're in the room with the providers, and then they go on to get specific checklists done. How do we operate the chamber? How do we operate the gas system? What do we do if the blood sugar is under 120? What do we do if the patient has ear pain? What do we do if they're nervous and the TV goes out? Everything. So we go down their competency checklists, uh, and then they get supervised proctored treatments where they ex get exposure to treatments that are underway. If it's a new center, they may travel to another center to see that. All of that rolls into their com process before they're able to touch a patient. But like I said, so everybody starts with the class. And then I should mention, if there's a provider who wants that competency training on the chamber or some exposure to that as well, even if they're not going to operate the chamber, they just want to know about it, we're, we're happy to provide that as well. Uh, but everybody starts with the 40-hour course. Good question. Any others? Okay. Well, you know how to reach us if you have any questions. We appreciate it. Thanks.